I'd like to especially welcome Dr. Katie Ahern, who is a New South Associate Archaeologist from Stone Mountain. She is a native of the Boston area and uh, educated in uh, Buffalo um, and escaped to the South fairly recently. And we welcome her to our area. Um, <clears throat> she has worked in several different states and in different countries. And particularly tonight, she's going to be talking about work she did in Guatemala in uh, 2018 and 2019. And um, have you been back since then to Guatemala? Oh, yeah, I know the feeling. Uh, I haven't been back since 1969. <laughs> anyway, uh, she's going to be talking about um, work she did on a, a particularly particular kind of archaeological site in the jungles of uh, southern of uh, lowland Guatemala, um, the the Maya area, and um, she mentioned just a little while ago that the one of the reasons that she went to that particular site is that it was found by the LIDAR surveys. Now, those of you who haven't heard about LIDAR need to look it up, but what it does is it is a system of using radar from, a, from an airplane down to the ground, and the, and the radar is able to distinguish between the ground and the vegetation so that with a, with a computer, you can take away the vegetation and see what the ground looks like. And here's this mountainous site that she's going to show you pictures of in a few minutes. Uh, this is, she's called it a, 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 Atalaya. Yeah. Atalaya. And it's a watch watchtower, basically. A, a, we would call it a, a fire tower around here. A fire tower. Fire tower. <laughs> okay. Why don't I shut up and let her do the job here? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming, baby. Hello, everyone. My name is Katie Ahern, um, doctor. I got my PhD in 2020, right during the beginning of COVID. I was one of the first, I think the only, yeah, I was the only uh, class in my the University of Buffalo to not walk oh, because of COVID. Yeah. No point. No. They didn't want us to die. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so welcome to this presentation today, guys. This paper focuses on watchtowers and defensive hilltop structures within associated with the ancient Maya. Where did my dissertation research? I just want to draw attention to this here. Basically, well, this is the top of the watchtower. I say watchtower and atalaya interchangeably. It's really, when I say atalaya, it's just the Spanish word for watchtower. So I say watchtower, watchtower often, just in different languages. But the site director and I decided to call it the Atalaya to distinguish it from uh, in papers. So we weren't just writing and saying watchtower. So there's a, so much going on, I just need to. Okay, so the Atalaya is located within the whole whole region, which is where that red line is. Specifically, I've been working at sites within Guatemala along the border with Belize, where the red circle is. And this is in northern Guatemala in the Batan. And here's a map to contextualize where the site is. Good. Hit the next one. Yay. Okay. So here is a timeline for the ancient Maya. I'm really only going to be talking about the late classic, the early classic, and the late classic. So just forget the others exist. The late classic really is just referring to this time before um, AD and the other times, not so much. We are going to stay on this slide for a couple minutes just for me to quickly go over some background information regarding ancient Maya and the warfare and warfare. So over the last 100 years, our understanding of ancient Maya warfare has shifted dramatically from beliefs that the Maya only engaged in small raids to capture sacrificial victims to the realization that they engaged in various scales of warfare and types of warfare. Despite these advances, the motivation for aggression and warfare during the pre-classic and classic periods in the Maya lowlands remain only partially understood. Some of the commonly cited motivations include competition for regional dominance, 
and conflicts over contested rulership. The motivation for warfare was also influenced by the cultural and historical context of both the individual site and the broader region. Additionally, there were real political implications of warfare, which impacted the settlement of the region and resulted in the construction of localized defenses, such as watchtowers. So the majority of information on late pre-classic period warfare comes from archaeological evidence, as there's limited ethnographic and iconographic data related to this period. Archaeological evidence of warfare includes the identification of fortifications, defensive structures, the burning and destruction of architecture, skeletal remains, and weapons. Clearest evidence of conflicts and warfare in the Maya region are really defensive walls, earthworks, and palisades. We hit the next slide. So watchtowers, this is a boring slide. I'll get more okay. exciting ones. Watchtowers or lookout points are defensive structures positioned in strategic locations that provide information to nearby centers regarding the observation of the surrounding landscape. Information from these watchtowers was likely signal to other sites through things like use of mirrors, fire, and smoke, and was utilized to protect centers by providing insight into the direction of attack by various warriors, by enemy warriors or raids. Watchtowers generally refer to sites that just contain a couple of platforms that were used to look over the landscape and often lacked walls surrounding the entire complex. Watchtowers continued to be built and used by the ancient Maya into the colonial period. A similar defensive hilltop structure are fortified hilltop sites and they're more like forts. They were also utilized by the ancient Maya. Fortified hilltop sites were much larger than watchtowers and could function as military outposts and staging centers for military ventures into territories of other policies. They often had the secondary purpose of serving as lookout points across the landscape, again, to see enemy warriors or raids. Many hilltop, fortified hilltop sites were residential centers that were later transformed into defensive locations with construction of large stone walls. And a lot of times these walls were built in anticipation of attacks, so beforehand, which is interesting. And many fortified hilltop sites would also serve as residential centers that were later transformed into defensive locations with construction of large stone walls. However, some of the sites, oh, both types of defensive hilltop complexes were localized strategies in dealing with local warfare that utilized the natural landscape to deal with the threat of warfare. Although the position of these complexes on large hills indicated their potential as observation and surveillance points, watchtowers were specifically designed for surveying the landscape. They also served as locations for conveying long distance communication. Watchtowers were also occasionally built as secondary things on the top of these hilltop sites. Yes, more exciting slide. I wanted to get the background done. That's like the wordiest bit. And now I'm good. For hand. So I did excavations at this site of what's not. Specifically, I will do this here. What's not is located, of course. Uh, I'm so sorry. What's not is located here. I also did excavations at Seaval and Home Wall is the base camp. So this is what's not is a three tiered pyramid, a uh, three tiered complex. So you have this is plaza one, this is a surface area. You have the second tier, so this is higher up elevation here, and then this is the palace, which is a third tier. Having three tiers or three levels to a, a complex like this, a monumental complex, actually provides excellent protection. Because if you have to get access to a ramp to get to the second, and then an access to another ramp, that makes it much harder to get access to the palace, which can be really useful for warfare, especially because What's not the site I have here was attacked by large scale warfare, which demonstrated that the Maya are capable of, the Maya, ancient Maya were capable of large scale warfare where they would come in and they would raise a whole city, <clears throat> which is something we didn't know until only recently. So it's not as an ancient Maya city located 15 kilometers to the north of Homo. So it's located on a karst escarpment. And the site's ceremonial core contained a three tier crop list, which now was one of the largest centers in the region. And it was predominantly occupied during the early to late classic period. However, there was some elements that were 
late pre-classic. And if you guys know anything about Maya architecture, this is an e-group. Just a type of architecture structure that's known to be aligned with astronomical events. Okay, you want to hit the next slide? Okay, so. That's some excavation. <laughs> yes. Um, so this is actually an excavation for two different sites. Um, it's rare when we come out of the field at the same time. But I worked with the whole mole archaeological project, which was run by Francisco Estrada Bella. And we would go into the field with large groups of individuals. So with Maya, with Guatemala archaeology, we don't have students to go do the digging for us like they do in Belize. In Guatemala, you hire local men, labor, to come help excavate with you. What's interesting about the sites that I did with the Homo Archaeological Project is the remoteness. So this is actually a gate to a national uh, jungle reserve where to get to this site, this gate that was heavily armed, we'd actually have to drive an hour, 30 minutes to an hour from the nearest town, which is Melchor de Mencos, which is a border town. It's right on the border with Belize. And then once we got to this gate point, depending on what site you were going to, you'd either drive two hours to Homo, or in this case, I, when I was at Witsna, I was working at a logging camp a legalized logging camp. That was about three to four hours away from the entrance. So what that meant is, first off, I was cut off from the world. There was no running water, except for my first two years, there was no running water. I had to take bucket showers. Wow, uh, what's great is you take bucket showers, right? It's right above you. <laughs> a double shower. But, um, <laughs> and then later when I was doing my excavations up it's not we had a generator for water so it was just pulling lake water that we were also using for drinking and cooking i had a special sterilizer pen because my mom bought one for me and i didn't want to drink the same water that all the wildlife was using too so i got to sterilize that but um still get used. So I was cut off from my first two years after the whole project. I was actually cut off from the world. I had a cousin go missing during one of those projects where I spent two months in the jungle. I didn't even know until they found her. I got out of the jungle and I had no idea. My last two years of the home wall home wall project, um, we had internet, so I could communicate with family, which is really nice. We have no cell phone service, nothing like that. And generator provides all the life we had. We'd live in tents in the middle <laughs> and hope for the best when it became the rainy season. Let's just make sure I covered it all the points. But yeah, during the 2018 and 2019 field season, the whole Mole archaeological project focused on some LIDAR results I had. Actually, I'll get to that in a second. So I focused my excavations there. If you want to hit the next slide. I do want to talk about the roads. There are no roads, not really. Um, they're used by loggers and then by archaeological teams and other individuals who go into the jungle. So the roads are all mostly mud. When we go into the jungle, it's during the dry season where there's not much rain. It's what it's six months of almost no rain. And then suddenly around June, July, it turns into the rainy season, where all it does is rain. So it takes you three hours to get into the jungle, but then it takes you like four or five hours to get out. And some of these workers are absolutely crazy. One time we fixed a car with just tree branches somehow. But I'm actually in the truck there. They didn't let me get out and push. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> Yes, you want to hit the next one? This is an image of LIDAR. I got permission from the site director to post it. This is cool because this is a densely forested area. So to be able to see what it's not look like, 
without a tree cover. So you can see the outlines here. You can see a causeway or a road that would have gone up to Eastwood Snow. Mm -hmm. Eastwood Snow is a series of hilltops first identified in 2017 by LIDAR. So the site director, Francis Gustard of LA, wanted to check out the pyramids. My pyramid is actually the hilltop temple up there, which is the highest point in the region. And it's actually a very well defensible structure. So it received the name Akalai because the summit provides an excellent vantage point where an individual can view almost all the sites in the region. It's also positioned in a naturally defensive location, as you can only access the west side. The rest have really steep sides. The watchtower was part of a hilltop architectural complex that contains a southern pyramid, a plaza, masonry structure, and a northern platform. There was also a wall on one side of it. Next one, please. Oh, yeah. Forgot there was an animation there. Well. So here is the base of the Atalaya. <laughs> So during the 2018 and 2019 field seasons, pan excavations were conducted here. This is the base. You can actually see some rubble here. This is stuff that's fallen from the top of the pyramid. So over time, heavy rains and just general tree growth over the last basically 2,000 years have led to collapse falling down the pyramid. We hit the next slide. So. During the 2018-2019 seasons, 10 excavations were conducted on the Atalaya and the surrounding architecture. So information being obtained through excavation, ceramic analysis, and the investigation of leaders' trenches. Ceramic analysis determined that the hilltop site was roughly occupied during late pre-classic and early classic periods. So yes. So there were three different leaders' trenches. So Guatemala has a lot of problems with looters, where looters will go dig through pyramids trying to find tombs and other valuable things that they can then sell. Mm -hmm. So there were three looters' trenches on this pyramid, one here, one there, and one at the very top. As a result, you can see that the pyramid no longer has a normal shape. It was heavily destroyed by looting, and as far as we can tell, they found nothing. So we did a tunnel, we did an excavation here, an excavation there, just a series of excavations to try to figure out what was going on. And this tunnel here is 60 meters. It's a big tunnel. The pyramid faced northwards and had a height of 18.45 meters. And uh, yeah, a 20 meter tunnel, so 60 feet tunnel, 20 meter along the center and farther inside. Okay. So if you want to hit the next one, I zoom in a little bit closer. So the Atalaya was originally built, its earliest phase of construction is this red line and this green line. It was basically a platform at this time during the late pre-classic period. And consisted of a multi-tiered platform. A second platform was located to the north, and basically on either side of this hill, there were two platforms that served as a way of looking over the landscape. So this elevated ground allowed people to survey the landscape. Both sets of platforms likely supported a masonry or perishable structures. Although the platforms were first thought to be residential, they resembled the two other watchtowers discovered at other sites. Like the Atalaya, these watchtowers were also positioned in the highest points in the region. So the positioning of a platform on the north and a platform on the south sides really allow individuals to look across the landscape and see what was going on. Can't see it, but there were, in a different image, you can see that there were masonry, there were stones here that may have indicated there was a masonry structure on top. So the early construction of the defensive hilltop site indicated the presence or threat of warfare in the region at this early period. Okay, next. So this is just showing basically two structures. 
either side. This we'll go into more detail in later, but it's just showing a preview. Okay, the next one. So this is one of the early platforms. It's a stone slab platform. I have not found anything to this degree in from other Maya sites. I found things that have a mixture of these various colored stone slabs, but they're much smaller size. So it's just an interesting puzzle to figure out eventually. But there's a stone slabs, which is weird for the Maya usually have nice masonry structures or they plaster the floor with limestone. To have a floor that's made out of just stone slabs is interesting. Also, so if you saw in the other image, the Maya built up, they made this into a pyramid. And just, do you see all these stones piled on top of each other? Can you imagine if that's fun to excavate? <laughs> we only made it 20 meters because it was just so dangerous. I mean, it's a lot to ask people from 2,000 years ago to take us into consideration, but it would have been nice. Mm. Some, a lot of Maya structures do have like construction floors where they do have, like they lay something across at various points to support the load of further rubble put on top, but it wasn't that way. It's like this site was just, they were really excited to just build it up as high as they could. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, here is the further platform. You could hit it again and again and again. Two more times. One more time. Yeah. Okay. So here is the stone slab platform. And here is the earthen platform. And those orange lines are where the masonry structure may have been. Mm -hmm. I do, this is kind of, it's a pseudo construction floor. Kind of protected us, but we had to pierce through it. If you ask me questions at the end, I will tell you about some of the rubble in more detail and potential earthquakes we have just rubble. But I'll focus on that later. Okay, so here's this again. Okay, so the Atalaya experienced two significant phases of expansion starting like the classic period. One, it went from these platforms all the way up to here, where they literally just piled stone upon stone upon stone. Actually, I guess I'll mention it now. The reason this is so high is because one day we were, um, they didn't, my excavating team did not let me into the tunnel. They were afraid I would hurt myself. Which to be fair, I had hit my head on stones. Mm -hmm. um, well, it was really dark. We had to have special battery so we could actually see inside there. But one day I heard an earthquake. Like there was a lot of rumbling. And the tunnel had collapsed on us. We had to spend two days uncovering it so we could get back in. We had to build special jungle styles, style. Um, like, oh, why am I forgetting? Just sticks to hold up, words of wood to hold retention walls. We had to build retention walls out of whatever we could find. So that's phase one. And then the orange is phase two, where they expanded it again in size. So the subsequent expansion raised the height of the watchtower by erecting a masonry structure at the top of the pyramid, which again provided the atelier with greater visibility. At this point, they abandoned the northern structure, and now they're really just focusing on threats to the south. <clears throat> so this substantial height really transformed the pyramid. And the thing I also want to point out is this orange is the staircase going all the way down the pyramid. It ended right here, and the plaza was here. This structure was not here yet. So the plaza, there was no staircase going all the way down to the plaza. Which means that to access the Atalaya at its full point, at, during the pre-classic period meant you had to either bring your own ladder or you had to bring rope. This was a highly defensible thing where you had to, you couldn't jump to get access 
the ass alive. You had to have something to help you get up there. So it ended a couple of meters above the plaza. And these modifications indicate a significant change in the defensive needs of the Atalaya, as attention shifted really to focusing on this southern side. So here, this is the end of the Atalaya. As another structure was built later, which kind of changed the purpose of the watchtower. If you could hit slide again. So here is the edge of the watchtower, where again, there is that jump. This is just later structure was built in front of it, but we're going to switch to the next slide. Okay. So a 1 to 1.5 meter wall was constructed along the western side of the Atalaya complex, and it prevented her slow access to the top of the hill. Although these don't look like they're in the best condition, 2,000 years ago they were really nice. Would have, on top of this wall would have been a palisade, a wooden palisade, that further created wooden or timber palisade that extended several meters of a barrier, making it really hard to access. And then Maya, the ancient Maya, often did a secondary strategy. They put certain plants like this. You guys ever seen a spiny palm? Next slide. This one is a little harder to see, but it's they're vicious. <laughs> um, so natural barriers such as thorny bush or spiny palms. These would have allowed warriors to really, they have a safe spot where they can shoot arrows or attack from the other side. Now, spiny palms, they've got, I guess the best way to say it is thorns that extend several inches outwards. So every day to get to the Atalaya, we'd actually have to drive an hour from our base camp. We actually one day cut our way a new trail through, so it would save us 30 minutes through an old path in the jungle. It, it was only a path that had been used maybe two years before, but it was all over. So to get, we don't drive an hour and then I have to climb 30 minutes up this um, hill. And the first couple of days, you get really tired walking 30 minutes in the humidity, especially if you're from Buffalo or Boston. <laughs> so if you got fatigued, you might try to grab something in front of you. Mm -hmm. And I have. <laughs> um, they make really good needles to like help get the other ones out of your skin. <laughs> I some of my workers have scars from them. Mm. Okay, next one. Well, the Atalaya had a wall, which is cool. It had a plaza. It had a strong. It had the Atalaya, a good watchtower. It had the remains of another watchtower. And then for some reason, during the early classic period, they built building directly in front of the Atalaya. So to give context, in the larger region was not experienced significant expansion during the early classic period that resulted in its transformation into a major power and independent polity. It was during this period that the Atalaya complex became affiliated with Zna. There's a hilltop structure really close to the Atalaya that actually contained the burial of the king associated with Witsna. And at this time, the Atalaya served as a restricted and important outpost. But during the early classic period, the last structure was built in the Atalaya complex, which I call Building A. My official site director has never said otherwise, so it is Building A. And Building A was erected in front of the Atalaya. There were at least two phases of floors associated with Building A. Can you hit a couple times? Four more times. Yeah, two more. Well, that's the building. Yes. So this makes it so much easier. This is why I wanted the animations. So this is the Atalaya, and here is the outline of a building. We never found the doorway for it, but you can see the building here. There's the floor that was heavily destroyed, probably partially by the ancient Maya at that time, but also because the Atalaya is attacked several times in its history, we found lots of burnt floors. So the building had two staircases. There's a staircase here, and a staircase there. What's interesting about the staircase is suddenly you don't have two, three meters 
gap between the staircase for the Atalaya and the ground. Now you can literally walk up these staircases and jump at the meter to get to the Atalaya, which is interesting that it's changing its purpose. Or is it? So suddenly you can either place a plank or it's just really easy to access the top of the Atalaya. And toward the end of this period for the early classic, you have something significant happen. Something so significant, I got on National Geographic. <laughs> so right over here, right here, is a cat, um, a shelter tomb, basically carved into the bedrock, a hole carved into the bedrock that would have sold, served as storage or as a well. And towards the end of the period, a ritual cache containing a human skull was found in the shelter. So you want to hit the next one? So the shelf team was carved from bedrock and positioned immediately in front of the Atalaya, the central axis of it. A ritual cache was discovered in the shelf team and contained four miniature vessels, two complete plate fragments, six pieces of obsidian, marine shell, and some broken shirt tools. It also contained, well, so the miniature vessels we found pretty close to the surface. As we continued digging deeper, we um, started uncovering a soil that was no longer white like the limestone, Bedrock around, but it was a little bit more yellow. And almost immediately, we started finding human teeth. Mm. What? We found human teeth within the yellow soil. Mm. So it was a rotted human skull mm. bone that was changing the soil color. And as we got deeper, we eventually found top cranium. But it had been placed directly in dirt, so it had eroded significantly over time. And its position was facing upwards indicating the skull was placed facing upwards like that. We can hit the next one. So here are the miniature vessels we found. Um, my site director was saying that they're miniature because the skull was mostly miniature. Mm -hmm. It was most likely a teenager. And this is images of the same plate. So ceramic analysis determined that the cache was placed after the initial construction of building A. But due to heavy erosion of the skeleton of uh, the skull, it was impossible to determine age or whether the individual was decapitated. However, a mixture of deciduous and permanent teeth may indicate that the skull belonged to a young teenager. After placing the ritual offerings, the cache was filled in and buried under 1.35 meters of hill. At a later point, a new floor was built on top of it. If you want to hit the next slide and then go to the video. Back in northern Guatemala. It's early morning at Francisco's base camp, three weeks after his excavations began. Building secrets. He's preparing to head out to his newly discovered pyramids, but the rains have arrived. We're going to be in the back of the truck for two hours, going to Usna. So it won't be like really wet by the time we get there. It's amazing, so This way I don't sweat too much. Francisco thinks he might have discovered a group of remote temples. He's already found an enormous number of ritually destroyed water pots and a monumental stone depicting a king that appears to have been ritually burnt. He's going to be joined by American archaeologist Katie Iron, who's been digging nearby. So we had a bit of a late start today because of the rain, but we'll be heading off shortly to the site. Rain's long just begun, <laughs> and the tracks are already water. Well yep. Kind of look a little bit more authentic. Yeah. 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 Katie has been excavating at a water at the base of the biggest of Francisco's pyramids. And inside, she has made an ominous discovery, human remains. So here are the teeth. We've got one, three roots. Three roots on a molar. That's a genetic trait for Native Americans. So the Maya. And then you have an incisor. So you, have, you have some milk teeth. Yeah. This is a, from a child or well, they could be different age children. The discovery of a child's teeth in Katie's water pit is a mystery. This 
is human remains that have been buried into this underground chamber that typically should be used to hold water. So there's there's many questions here at this point. So her job is to excavate uh, this entire uh, set of artifacts and maybe at the end we'll have some answers. In the water pit, Katie has also found what she thinks is part of a pot. Can I go in there? Yes. This is going to be a big, yeah, a big one to excavate. Katie? Yeah. I found something. I'm not sure it's a pot. I think it could be the top of somebody's head. Oh. What Katie thought was the base of a pot is, in fact, a human skull. Oh, it looked like a bowl, but it's really got all these bumps. Yeah, it's a small one, so it could be a a young person, a child. It was it was this way, and the teeth probably came from just above it. So everything is consistent with this not being a bowl, being a decayed skull, and this is just the back of it. It could be a ritual burial or a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. The lack of any other bones in the pit yeah. suggests to Katie that this was no ordinary burial, but something much more gruesome. It is possible, since we've only found the base of the skull, that this individual was sacrificed at a young age, maybe decapitated. The Maya believed in sacrificing only what was precious to them. And in Maya society, the most precious of all were children. Typically, uh, uh, storage chambers, they become uh, symbols for uh, the, the underworld. So they put offerings to the dead and to, you know, to the gods of the underworld in there. But this could be one of those mm -hmm. cases. Until the light arts, no one had any idea that there was anything built on this remote jungle bridge. But now, Francisco's newly discovered site at Witsna, with its group of mystery pyramids, is already yielding astonishing evidence of religious ceremonies and gruesome ritual killings. Found the skull of a child there. Yeah. So what I like from this video is really just getting to see what was going on in a better way that I can't really do. Mm -hmm. And that LiDAR image really shows you the scale of everything versus what I have. Um, of course, I'm not sure how many presentations I'll give on watchtowers. I just have to show off my presentation yeah. one more time. <laughs> I used to teach. Um, so the Atalaya continued to be monitored by the movements of enemy troops from nearby centers until the watchtower was attacked and abandoned towards the end of the early classic period. This attack resulted in the ritual burning of the plaza and surrounding architecture. Additionally, we identified shirt wide bases like this one found in the plaza that were potentially used as spears or lance points, which were common weapons used during the ancient Maya periods. We also found this altar here, which you can kind of see at least here is an image, but it's been heavily destroyed. So there are things called chickley trees. They're where you get the chickley gum. So gum comes from chickley trees. They love stealing. They love altars. They grow where the limestone is. So when you find one, a chickley tree, you usually find or altar that's been destroyed by it. Okay, wanna hit the next one? So the Atalaya, complex experience multiple phases of construction that aligned with the intensification of warfare during major transitional periods in the region. Additionally, the majority of floors and platforms found in the various phases of construction of the hilltop complex were burnt. The episode of burning suggests that the Atalai was besieged multiple times throughout its history, beginning in the late pre-classic period. The discovery of spear points in the plaza and significant number of burnt floors indicate that the final phase of occupation of the Atalaya ended in fire and war. But the construction of the Atalaya really shows this early adoption of localized strategies 
of defense in the region, which is cool. And here's a final view from the top of the Atalaya. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We, we get questions? Yes. Get questions. Uh, I have one question about the architecture. Yes. Uh, an example would be uh, slide 15. I don't know if you can bring that up or not. Slide 15? Uh, oh my gosh. Yes, you do. That one also. Uh, the animation so you can see the colors because otherwise it's just so hard okay my question is the arch uh, a little cool. bit i know about I, i've taken i took one course college uh in mesoamerica archaeology so i don't that was many years ago uh and i remember studying that, that what i thought i remembered from those that course was the closest that the mines got to a true arch was a cobble arch. Yeah, that is true. Okay, that sure doesn't look like a cobble arch. It looks like a classic arch, which means, well, you know, did they do that or what? <laughs> well, it's nice of that. Um, I was drawing it and I was using like cat pro. And I was struggling to draw a lot as perfect as it was, but it was just a man-made time. So it wasn't kind of a large? Well, it was just all rumble there. Mm -hmm. We we tried to make it nice looking so I could take a drawing of it. Okay. But it is man-made. Mm -hmm. And one of the real short questions. Uh no, be quiet. Uh what was the closest major uh, Mayan city to, to this site uh, that, so, that we might recognize? Naranjo. Naranjo is one of them, but I guess the closest, most well known is Tikal. Tikal is not that far away. Was Lamanai to the east of there? Yeah, Lamanai is in Belize along the coast. Was it Zenantinij? Zenantinij isn't that far away either. If you go to this map, Slide. Yes. So, Dunantinich is right around. So, here's Melchor de Mencos, and then there's San Ignacio, and then it's right around here ish. Dunantinich. Yeah. Uh, Lemon Eyes right around here. Tikal is right around here. So, how far was Tikal? Maybe 30 kilometers. <laughs> Probably a bit more than that, but no, I've been there. But... You can't get there from land, though. You can't. <laughs> Did you see both? Yeah. <laughs> Could I ask something about the construction? I, I'm still a little in the dark. This Atalaya is on top of the highest peak around. Yeah. And is the entire thing man made? No, the hill seems to be natural, but 18 meters of it is a pyramid. 18 meters, okay. Oh. So they stack rocks up on top of the top of the yes. That makes sense. But if you're trying to do a, 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 a watch shower, that makes sense, I guess. Manny, slide 15 again, please. Thank you, Manny, for manning everything. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's <laughs> so convoluted. Oh, no. But this is this is our first time trying to do this live. See the hillside there, uh, upper left of Foundation One, I believe it's the back in the one. Yes. Uh, what's the distance approximately up the curve line to the top of the tower? From here. Yes. Yeah, from the curve line to the top. Of the tower. Yes. You just pull up the exact measurements. 18.45, so minus three, so probably about like 15.45 meters. Okay. About 45, 18. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty sizable. Yes, it, was. it was fun climbing up it. I wanted to ask uh, when they the, the towers were first used, um, how many 
20 people would have been there. And then they lived there. And then, and then later, it was occupied by more when they started building another structure? Well, from our best guesses, we wanted to say originally that it would be probably something seasonal or during certain seasons. Like, it doesn't make sense to go to war during the rainy season where it's raining constantly. So it'd be more likely that war would be waged during the dry season. So we did find some vessels that were domestic. <clears throat> So there were individuals probably at times hanging out there, um, manning the fort, the watchtower, probably on the northern platform. But we don't, there wasn't settled substantially, probably only somewhere between 10 and 20 people at the most just stationed there. Yes. Where did all the most? Did they quarry it? Is it just, it's everywhere? Um, so Up the road. <laughs> <laughs> so the top of the hilltop structure. Yeah, if you want to go to slide 12, it's not the best image. But yeah, yeah. So this is, <laughs> this is roughly the Atalaya area. There was a plaza eventually, but the back area was a sunken plaza. It was mined for the limestone. There was also another quarry right around here, which kind of led to it being steamer, where they were taking some of that limestone to build up a little high peak, basically, mm -hmm. of pure stone. All the work. So they were closer, but it was still. We didn't have enough hard hats. I wish we had hard hats for every member of the crew because it was just falling rock. Yeah. I'm very interested in the uh, use of LIDAR and ground penetrating radar and that sort of thing. Um, and it's interesting to me that it's quite so useful with so much stone that's homogenous, you know, it's changed homogenous. But I was reading recently that. Uh, LIDAR is being used in uh, White Sands, New Mexico with the, uh, the human tracks uh, mixed up with the megafauna tracks. Some of the tracks are, uh, they call them ghost tracks because they, they depending on, I don't know, maybe barometric pressure or something, but they kind of appear and disappear. Uh, but they're surveying several tens of square kilometers. You look turkeys. Um, and and um, not only are they able to to find the tracks, they, they're able to find the interesting ones. The, they're able to assess the depth and uh, the um, they've also learned that the, the tracks not surprisingly follow uh, an ancient stream uh, with a watering hole where you have lots of, lots of tracks, but all of that just from from the use of the light on. What a tool! Yeah, yeah. Big LIDAR study done for the Maya that really made us realize that at a time when the Maya, during the, the classic, classic period, we used to think there were only maybe a couple million of people in the um, North and South America. We now realize that just in Mesoamerica alone, there might have been upwards of 10 million people, mm. which is crazy to our earlier, some of those misconceptions we used to have mm -hmm. based in racist ideology that it was very sparsely inhabited natives everywhere were very sparsely inhabited so when the explorers came they didn't do have to do much the land was basically available. no it was very heavily it's only going to get better with the uh, 
new technology for lots to learn. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Yes, I'll get. Are, are you going back? <laughs> So I've got I've got a question. Hi. Hopefully. Um let me get this straight. I've just I mean, look, are we saying that th this site was found with LIDAR and archaeologists did not know about this site before it was found with LIDAR? Number one question. And number two, yes. did you say that the looters had already found the site? Uh, but the archaeologists didn't know about it till after LIDAR? <laughs> uh, how did that go? It's the individuals who have been logging. Um, so this natural preserve is allowed to be logged because it's a way of making it more sustainable. So sometimes some of the loggers are archaeologists or they're the archaeologist workers. Um, the laborers who end up spending so much time doing archaeological excavations that in some cases they're better than the archaeologists. Mm -hmm. I've met a couple. And so when the loggers are going to find prized trees that sell for well that fit the quota of what they're allowed to take out of the jungle, they do a lot of exploring. And some of them may end up telling looters who go for treasure hunting. And it's tough because when you have people who are so impoverished, yeah. if they can find something that they're going to get a rip off on, or someone's going to pay them half the price or a fifth of what the price is worth, but it feeds their family, it's why looting will happen. It's because of desperation. Yeah. But at the same time, it's disappointing when you want to find cool things that tell you about the history of the past. Where you were employing Guatemalan labor to do a lot of the work, were you Yes. Not? Did you have um, Guatemalan graduate students working with you? So, yes. So, Guatemala is really cool. Um, in Guatemala, if you for every U.S. archaeologist you bring on to a site, you have to hire a local Guatemalan archaeologist. Mm. So, you do have local Guatemalan archaeologists working. They actually have a cool system where they have a six-year undergrad, where they learn Everything an archaeologist is really supposed to learn. They know they learn ceramics, they learn lithics, they learn how to draw. And then there's me learning how to draw as a grad student. <laughs> Still learning more about lithics right now. Because those were things my grad school didn't prioritize. It prioritized theory, not learning lithics or mm -hmm. ceramics. Can, can you speculate at the time of the occupation? Did they remove the forest? Was it clear and open so you could see this old structure and there were no trees on it? They trim, turned them all down? I don't think there would have been trees on the structure or on the plaza or on top of the hilltop because it would have given them greater visibility not to have right. them. Yeah. I know some of the famous pictures like Tikal, a lot of that would have been, there would not have been as many trees. Some of them would have been still there, you know, for still have decorative trees. Um, they might help. Like, a lot of the Maya houses would have things like household gardens, where they would still have plants. Like, so when I'm in the jungle, 97% of the trees are put there because of the age of Maya. They're useful for humans. So this allowed them to gather what was necessary from what they needed from the wolves from the trees, but they would not have been happy. Their cities would not have been covered. A lot of those trees would have been removed. Yeah. It makes things easier, especially for plaza ceremonies, daily interaction. So what we see now is cities that have largely been neglected for the last <laughs> thousand plus years, which always astonished my students. Questions? Talk about being uh, there. I mean, we're, we know there there were defenses major purpose, but were there other uh, uses like astronomical phenomena? 
that they've been using that for that sort of purpose since that seemed to be their thing. So if you go get down, no, up, I mean, yeah, yeah. So you go to slide five. So this is something known as an e-group here. It's a Western radial pyramid facing an Eastern elongated platform. These really developed during the middle and late classic periods. And we're not 100% sure on the astronomical significance, but there are certain ones that do align with the solstices and equinoxes. Mm -hmm. So standing on top of the Western radial pyramid, you can see the equinox over. Mm -hmm. And then two solstices that way. So we do know the Maya were very interested in astronomy. We can tell it from the text that we have left. I'm not sure if these watchtowers would have been significantly lined. Actually. So the site director did publish, I should say Francisco Estrada Ballet did publish something suggesting that some of the e-groups align with certain hilltops within the region, some of them more so than others. But I think one of the e-groups at Seabal actually aligns in the distance with the Watchtower, so the Atalaya. So technically, I guess, looking from it, you might be able to see a solstice, but it was so far too. So there may be astronomical significance associated with these watchtowers. You mentioned watchtowers plural, so you're aware of a bunch of others then? There are I know there's a grad student who was going to reach out to me when I talked about this at SAAs who never did, but apparently he has something like this. And then there's one other site that has a northern and southern platform aligned just like the early stages of the Atalaya that they also believed was a watchtower. I know there's, with LIDAR, suddenly people are finding these hilltop structures, so I'm sure there's going to be more watchtowers discovered in like 10, 20 years. Hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if they littered, they scattered across the landscape, where again, if needed, you could potentially have some water the frames. Fires being lit at different hilltop structures, although in this case it might just be smoke. Or using mirrors to make different symbols. Yes. But what percentage of um, uh, that area has had LIDAR performance? Uh, 10%, 50%? It's if we're looking right there. That map, I'd say five, hmm. maybe less. Wow. So there's a lot more out there than you have seen. Yeah. It's, it was expensive. It's expensive technology. So. I believe it was aircraft. I know New South, my company, will occasionally use LIDAR on a drone, but I'm not sure what the quality is like compared to an airplane. Well, was this uh, paid for by the Guatemalan government or some other international group or something? Local funders. Oh, okay. Can give you more once it's not recorded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still recording. What's the elevation of this area? So something I didn't get to. You can kind of see here, there are ridges, but along the rivers, there's a lot of bajos, seasonal swamps. So during the rainy season, suddenly there are a lot of swamps ever, mm -hmm. which is a good source of water, but it's also, it's, it's lowlands. So it's close to sea level. You have hills scattered throughout, but it's pretty wet during the wet season. I know there were climatic changes between at different times that made the trade more difficult. I know during the pre-classic period, it was easier to get around potentially or less droughty 
there's just lots of different climatic studies going on to figure out how the climate has changed and shifted. Because we know during the late classic period is where we have these mega droughts that start affecting certain cities, leading to some Maya cities to collapse, not all. So. Aren't there some these um, slot bays, the, the raised roadways. I kept coming and see some of these, what was showing, a series of maps that show where these go, but I haven't seen it yet. So if you go down a couple slides, yeah, this one, eight. Here's one of them. Wonderful. Oh, yes. Okay. So, in this case, this is sea level. This is a big lake. So, this would have been a little bit higher than the lake, but I can't give you direct how many meters above the lake it was. Then to go even further higher. So, it's now it's in a hilly area. We were south of Belmapon in the jungle near Sleeping Giant. Do you know the area? I know Belmapon. Okay. And Michigan State was there doing some archaeological carbon dating and some skulls they had found. But we, my son was getting married to a Belizean, and they got married down there. But for his bachelor party, there was a, our family went into a ceremonial cave that had just been found five months before we got there. And it was higher up in the mountains, which south of Belmont Pond. That's why I was asking, because some of these watchtowers and things, they were starting to pop up. People were finding them, but they hadn't utilized the technology to lay out how it went all the way into Guatemala. And Because yeah. I think there's all these connecting pieces that we just don't know yet. And everywhere you look, it was Mayan ruins. It was remarkable. So, although Belmont Pond Yes, they have technically different, although Guatemala would disagree that Belize is still not its own country. It's great if you go look at like some Guatemalan maps, they still claim Belize. But despite them being two different countries, they're both complete ancient Maya territory. They're spread across the whole thing. You even get a little bit into Honduras and Mexico, lots of Mexico. Um, there are lots of cave systems. I've been in cave systems in both Belize and actually only in Belize. Um, if you guys are interested in reading about spelunking, I'm not sure I'd advise anyone to go spelunking anymore okay. after my experience, but I went to ATM, which is a cave system where they have crystal of Maida. And basically it's a cave that you, you can touch the ground if you're my height, it can still go up to here-ish. So we went through the cave system with water, it would have been relatively dry when the ancient Maya were conducting sacrifices in there. But during a drought period, they were taking royalty children, so um, elite children, because they were the most precious, elite male children, and taking them deep into this cave and then sacrificing them, binding them up and then slitting their throats. That's where they were trying to get rain? Yes, yeah, one of those games. Going up. To the sky to make gray gray clouds or yeah, yeah. I think the same clouds. There's a bunch of them. Yeah, I think there's a couple of them. This one was the crystal maiden because there was also a teenage girl who was found in a defensive position. So they didn't tie her up. They didn't drug her. She fought back and she's crystallized in the cave. But we had to climb a lot and we were very far from the entrance. Ooh. And the only thing keeping us knowing where we were was the light on our helmet. And then of course. The cave guides, the end, were like, you guys are young and excitable. You want to take the back route? The back route was not a good idea. <laughs> the cave walls were really tight, and I couldn't touch the ground. So I had to, like, walk all along like this, but I couldn't touch the ground. And I was like, I never go to school. <laughs> my, my mom and my sister love heart, so I'd see <laughs> Like, the descent and stuff. So when I got back, I was like, I'm going to die. Well, thank you very much for coming and giving us a wonderful presentation this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.